Hi, I'm Cheryl Waters. Thanks for joining us. It's live on KEXP at home, and we appreciate all of our wonderful listeners and donors who support KEXP, listening worldwide at kexp.org and enjoying all these great live sessions. Even during the pandemic, we're so excited to continue to share live music with you. And we are very excited about the new Flock of Dimes record, Head of Roses. And I've got Jen Wozner with me today. Hi, Jen. Hi, Cheryl. Good to see you. It is so great to see you, too. And I just have to tell you, this new record is magnificent. Earlier Earlier this week, I was playing the song Price of Blue on my show, and a friend messaged me, ugh, this new flock of dimes is so gorgeous. And I replied right away and said, I was just thinking the same thing. I'm dancing around with my arms thrown up in the air right now. I mean, it is just such a beautiful record, and it elicits... So much happiness and emotion. And I just have to say, you are so freaking talented. Oh, gosh. I don't know how to take that much. uh, I can't take that many compliments and know what to do with my face. Um, Thank you. I'm I'm very moved. Thank you for saying that. It, It feels really good to hear because making this record kind of brought me back to life and brought me back to myself during a really, really sad and dark and challenging time. And the experience of being in the studio, making these songs with my friends, um, was easily one of the most joyful parts of my year. So it just is a wonderful feeling to know that I'm able to pass that, that feeling on to some other folks out in the world. It's kind of the whole point of all this ridiculousness. So thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. Well, I have to ask a question you've been asked a thousand times by now, how you've been coping the past year. I know you spend a ton of time on tour with all the bands that you're in and in other projects. You're constantly around people, which I know that you enjoy. You're a real people person, but it sounds like you've lived alone for a few years now. And I know for myself who live alone that solitude can be very nourishing and something that we often seek out. And I'm sure when you were touring a lot, it was a very welcome respite. And, you know, it's a very different thing now. None of us could have imagined the solitude that we would be forced into. And I'm wondering how the past year has been for you. It sounds like you've been incredibly busy making music, but is it something that you leaned into or that you kind of pushed against? You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, uh, was going through, um, the breakup that, you know, started sort of the, to light the flame that became a lot of, uh, the songs on this record. And, um, and that sort of in combination with this unexpected, uh, traumatic collective traumatic event that we're all experiencing, um, my, my initial reaction was that every bone in my body just railed against it. I mean, I was, I was in a really, um, uneven, unsteady, unhappy place. Um, and you know, I wouldn't have expected looking back, you know, it's a year later now and I'm, my life is relatively in many ways what it was then. Um, but I'm maybe the happiest I've ever been strangely. Um, I think, uh, I will look back on this time as both incredibly difficult and and incredibly important. It's been really eye opening. I think, um, I have, I am, as you said, a bit of a people person and I'm also a bit of a recovering workaholic and, um, hopefully recovering (laughs) fingers crossed, but, um, but I didn't realize I never stopped over all, all those years to really, uh, examine my motives for the way that I was living. Um, and there were certainly some things that I think I, um, was maybe reluctant to look at, um, just, um, under the surface that I had been using my busy life and, um, all the people in my life as, as a a distraction from, and I was pretty high functioning with it. You know, I, I wouldn't have considered myself to be unhappy in any way. Um, but it took getting to this point where I kind of hit a wall, um, for me to uncover these deeper layers of, of myself, um, to process some things that I had been avoiding and to, I think, I guess, come into a greater, um, 
sense of presence and awakeness to my own life as I'm experiencing it and not just constantly projecting forward into the future or back into the past, but learning to sort of like stop and slow down and, and enjoy the life that I'm living in, in every moment. And so I'm thrilled. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's hard to say anything good about a terrible event that's, that's hurt. And, and we've, we've lost so many in this year and it's been, it's been incredibly tragic and incredibly traumatic. Um, but, uh, on a personal level, I, I think leaning into some of those silver linings has been helpful for me. Interesting. That makes me think of two questions. You said that you sort of worked on your workaholic tendencies, although you had all of this time to do this work. And I'm wondering if that growth would have come without processing it through the work. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I don't know. I mean, I think um, it's not just the work because that's, you know, songwriting has been my go-to framework for self-exploration and understanding of self and other for as long as I can remember. That's the easy one in some ways for me. Um, but I think some of the, the less, um, compelling (laughs) ones are equally meaningful. Like for example, you know, like having a practice, having a meditation practice, um, or like really consistently showing up and like being really honest and vulnerable in, in therapy or, you know, exercising regularly, you know, like the, the sort of like more boring, less sexy kind of, uh, parts of getting to take care of yourself and getting to know yourself. And, um, and yeah, so I think it's a balance between, I think the work absolutely is essential for me. And I, uh, that's why even now my record's not even technically out yet as we're taping this. And I'm already like, I can't wait to start writing the next one because I have so many things I want to understand and, and, and figure out and, and say, um, but I also think there's more to, I think that the dimension of it, the, like being able to lean into other sides, other less explored parts of myself and my routines and my personality, um, has been the real eye opener. And I'm not sure that I would have done that by choice. I think that was something that I was kind of like, I won't say forced into, but I mean, I, I made the choice, but it was, um, it was something that I feel like I wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been given this sort of universal timeout. It's great that you did have the time to spend doing these great things like meditating and exercising, as you said, and hopefully you've been doing them long enough that you've created a habit and we'll be able to stick to them. You had an interview with Meg Duffy where they referred to having withdrawal from their distractions. And that was something I could really connect with. I mean, I did similar things in this year of spending so much time alone, you know, connected with some some patterns of behavior and activities that have been very nourishing for me. But I'm wondering if you went through something similar where you had to go through a withdrawal from all the distractions that kept you from doing those things in the past. Absolutely. I mean, it still feels that way sometimes. Um, I think the brain can get really attached to patterns and routines and habits, you know, even destructive habits can become familiar and really commonplace. And, um, and so I don't know if it would have been so easy for me to really start making healthier choices for myself. Um, if it hadn't, if the circumstances hadn't been so dire, but yeah, the withdrawal is real and it's, I felt it and I, and I still feel it. I think the trick is to sort of like have this, it's like an act of faith, right. To like lean into the things that, you know, you're supposed to do or that, you know, your intuition is telling you that you're supposed to do before you start feeling the payoff, the rewards, because it takes some time, you know, you have to sort of like lean into it and commit, um, as an act of faith. And, uh, eventually for me, at least I feel like, um, the payoff really happens, but it's, it's slow and it's inconsistent. So it is a practice. I mean, that's why I think of it, uh, many of these things as a practice, because it's, it's going to feel different every day, but it's so much of it is about just the showing up, the like making it a point to show up. Sounds like you've done a lot of work of all types <laughs> in this past year. I mean, you released two EPs over the summer, one with Y Oak working with the Brooklyn Youth Chorus and then the Flock of Dimes EP. And I guess then, I did, didn't I? Huh. Yeah, yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, it does sound like Head of Roses was written in the early days of mm-hmm. 
COVID, or at least most of it. So Mm -hmm. you did a lot this year. You know, the funny thing is it really doesn't feel like it. Um, and I know that, that what you, you know, when you say that, I'm like, Hey, that is true. But like, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think because I've had so much more time to myself that I haven't had to sacrifice, um, a slower, uh, more methodical way of life to get all these things done. Cause I actually feel like in many ways, this has been one of the best you know, the least frantically, um, work centric years of my life. And I think it's just, it looks very, it is very productive, but it's been productive in, in ways that are invisible too. Um, I've just had, I've had a lot more time on my hands, you know, when I'm not touring, it's, um, it it clears up a lot of space for me. So. Did it feel good to be making these records in that kind of environment? Oh, it was a gift. I mean, honestly, I think, I guess I don't really have to choose, but I think making records is my favorite thing to that I do, um, even more than playing shows sometimes. And so um, it was a joy. And and I guess that it really brought me back to myself at a time when I really needed it. And it's also a social experience, too. It's collaborative. You know, it's like you I had all these songs, but part of the joy of making records is sort of like bringing other people into the process. And that's always really special and meaningful, but particularly this year, because, you know, we were all so lonely and we were also, not only were we like starved for collaboration, but we were starved for straight up human contact. So, um, I, I think I'll always look back on the, you know, few weeks that we made this few short weeks that we made this record is one of the most magical times of my life. Just, I think the pure gratitude that we all had for the fact that we were privileged enough to be in that space with each other, making music was, um, It was really a potent feeling. Well, I don't think any of us knew what to expect, you know, a year ago, but one of the great things to come out of the past year is so much great music, and that's something I've been really grateful for. Head of Roses out April 2nd, and you've recorded some beautiful songs exclusively for KEXP. Let's watch Two and Price of Blue now. It's Flock of Dimes live on KEXP at home. Enjoy. Just wearing bodies 
like a costume till we die can i be one can we be two can i be for myself still be still with you is it all for fun is it just brand new little life in words can i be one can we be two can i be for myself still be still with you is it all for fun is it just brand new little life in one but the ways are two the ways are two
That's Flock of Dimes live on KEXP at home. And that was that last one there was Price of Blue, the song I was talking about, dancing with my arms flailing above my head. <laughs> I was just in such a blissful place. And tell me about starting working on this new record. I know that you've been living um, in North Carolina for a while now and you live outside of Durham. It sounds like small town life is a good fit for you. What do you love about living in a small town and how did that kind of, you know, work into making music? I think um, it's interesting when I envisioned living here initially, it was sort of in combination with a job that brought me to virtually every major city in America once a year. Um, Because I also love cities too. And I love people and I love the input that you can get from being in those bustling spaces. But I think um, when you're traveling a lot, you, your concept of what home means to you kind of shifts. And I think for me, um, home was always a place to, to rest, um, and to be at peace as much as possible. And, and so, um, proximity to nature, I think has, has become a pretty big part of my life. I wouldn't have expected that in my, you know, um, in my younger days, I think I was just like, and I'll live, I'll live in a city till I die. But, um, but I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of anxiety, sort of naturally, kind of kicking around, um, and and it is it, it not caused by, but but often exacerbated by my surroundings, and so um, I just find that if I have some access to nature, um, semi regularly or on a daily basis, I I am at peace a lot more. I'm uh, I'm a lot more focused. I'm a lot less distracted, and I'm a lot calmer. Um, which is how I want to feel when I'm at home. Um, and I think in the, the pandemic, I, I do miss, there are so many things I miss about um, so many places and so many people. Um, but I think um, being able to spend this time in a place that is uh, relatively beautiful and peaceful and calm has been uh, a real gift for me that I'm really grateful for. Well, I know you worked on the record with Nick Sanborn of Sylvan Esso, and I think I read that Nick and Amelia have a studio in the woods that's not too far from you. Is that where you made the record, that blissful few weeks that you talked about? It is, yeah. I'm very fortunate. I mean, honestly, this record would not have been possible to make when I made it, if not for the existence of that studio, Betty's. Um, And... uh, you know, they had been planning for a while, you know, this, this space that, you know, was going to be for them, but also a community space that, um, for everyone to, to share and make art out of and, um, and kind of like, uh, be in communion around, uh, which is a beautiful vision that they had. Um, and they made it a reality and they're, um, they're really exceptionally generous with the space. Um, and it's only, you know, 10 minutes from where I live, which is really convenient. So, um, you know, we, and we, I live alone. And so those two were part of my, well, they were pretty much the entirety of my little COVID pod. Um, and so it it made making this record actually possible, which, you know, if I'd had to travel to another studio, um, and you know, it just wouldn't have been safe and I wouldn't have felt comfortable doing it. But the fact that Betty's was there, um, and we could kind of gather there safely was what sort of allowed this whole record to take shape at a time when I really, really needed a lift. So I'll always be grateful for that. Well, the end product, again, is just so magnificent. And Ooh. you opened up this album for a lot of collaboration. I mean, you as an artist have collaborated with so many people, but I have the impression that Flock of Dimes has been more of a solitary project in the past. I mean, maybe that's not correct, but you worked with a lot of people, Meg Duffy mm-hmm. of Hand Habits on this, uh, Bon Iver's, Matt McCann, um, Adam from Landlady, of course, your Y Oak partner, Andy Stack, I'm try- and then Nick. I'm trying to think, have I forgotten anyone? Um, I don't think so. Yeah, I think that's the crew. I'm trying to rack my brain. No, I think that's everyone. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, it was considering the circumstances, it was a, it was a little skeleton crew, but it was a solid, I mean, just a bunch of incredible players in that group and incredible people and really good friends. Um, and you're right. I mean, I think I started Flock of Dimes initially because I wanted another outlet. Um, I think sometimes I can get frustrated at the glacial pace of the music industry 
and the release schedules, you know, that take this, these huge chunks of time to, to allow these songs to come out into the world. And so I, and I write a lot. Um, so I, I feel like I need uh, as many outlets as I can get to sort of cycle this music out into the world so I can make, you know, new music. And so, um, but I also think a big part of when I started this project was to sort of challenge myself to see what I could do on my own as a producer and as a songwriter, um, and as a musician. Um, but I also think I had a lot more, uh, internalized, um, insecurity and maybe even internalized misogyny, um, when I made that first block of Dimes record, because I felt, I really truly felt as though I had to, I had something to prove that I, I felt as though I was not getting the benefit of the doubt of my own artistry and like the things that I was capable of. And that, um, if I had made a record where I was, I had, you know, my hand in every part of it, if I produced it and I played all the instruments and I wrote all the parts that like, then everyone would see. And like, (laughs) and really it was just about me. It was about my ideas of like, it was about getting over my own shame and insecurity really. Um, because I think, um, you know, I'm very proud of that first record, but at the same time, I don't think that having like a, a tight fisted, uh, kind of grip on every aspect of the creative process makes the best records. I think that letting it breathe and letting people into the process and sharing and, um, bouncing ideas off of others, um, is, um, actually what makes records sound dynamic and, and varied and interesting and, um, and can surprise you, you know? And so, I'm really happy to be at a point, like, I feel like that first record, I needed to make that in the way that I did. Um, but I'm happy to be at a point where I feel like now I can just sort of invite the world in. And I, I just kind of feel like I have less to prove and I just I can focus on making the coolest thing that I can make. Well, you embraced a lot of pain and loss on this record. You've said both that was inflicted on you, but that you potentially inflicted on other people as well. And you've said in interviews that it takes an incredible amount of strength and empathy to sit with an uncomfortable feeling. And I have also found that over many, many years of personal work to be very true and also very difficult, something so simple as that. And it sounds like you sat with those feelings during the, at least, writing of this record. What did you learn that surprised you? I love this question. I'm so happy that you asked because um, I would say that this process unfolded into layers upon layers that I couldn't have predicted in some really beautiful and significant ways. Um, Because it started so small and so granular. It started with just me and my own pain and my own heartbreak and my own loss And sort of being in a situation where I was, um, I had recently hurt someone that I cared about very deeply, but then I was also (laughs) then also having my heart broken by someone else. And so, um, I was contending with this reality of like, of, uh, love and pain and how I do think that it's easy in those situations to form stories around, uh, essentially the avoidance of painful truths about yourself or about others. And so in that situation, I was not in a place where I could say, I could really paint myself as just the victim. Um, you know, I had to kind of accept that part of connection with another person involves doing harm when you don't intend to do harm and being in pain when you really would rather not be. But I think the most surprising part about that is, you know, I was making this record that felt very, um, self-focused at a time in the world and, and in our society and in our country that felt um, like people were kind of looking with an eye to the collective uh, experience in a new way. And it felt weird at first to be like, oh, and I'm making this record and it's just all about me and my feelings and oh, that's so selfish and it's so self-focused. But as I started to sit with the basic premise and I remember having this, this like light bulb moment where I was like, oh, so much of the harm that is done in this world and the systems of harm that are created and the systems of harm that we live inside of all trace back to the avoidance of those exact same painful truths. So like what I mean by that is when someone chooses to ignore reality and instead convince themselves that something like um, white supremacy isn't real or patriarchy isn't real or that capitalism can end in any way other than certain destruction that like 
the use of all the resources on this finite planet isn't the path that we're headed or, you know, like it's like, it's all avoidance and, and it's what our brains are built to do. You know, we don't want to sit with this discomfort. We don't want to sit with the pain. Um, but we must like, it's what this moment I think is really calling us to do. And I, so I think to answer your question, the most surprising thing for me was understanding all of a sudden that these, uh, this reality that I thought had just been, uh, about me and my experience and my trauma and my relationships, um, had opened up this door to greater understanding of the way that we relate to each other on a societal level on a systemic level. Um, and that like something as simple as a song about healing that hopefully can like reach someone at a fundamental level, um, can actually maybe inspire them to process their own trauma so that like healing can occur in the collective as well. Um, and it, it sort of gives the, a sense of purpose to it other than just like my own feelings and my own vanity. So that's my answer. <laughs> what an incredible opportunity for growth and potentially not only for you, but for others. I mean, communication is key and you've really opened yourself up um, to be a great communicator when you go that deep. I mean, I think it's really, it's hard, but I think it's, it, it takes practice. Like everything, like we were saying at the beginning of this interview, it's practice, you know, and the fear of failure is, is, I mean, even just now sitting in this interview with you, I'm like, oh, I'm going to put my foot in my mouth. I'm going to say something stupid. I'm going to, I'm not going to articulate this the way I want to, but like, that's what's so special about, I feel like something like music that can, that has the potential to sort of like settle our hearts and settle our bodies and give us this sense of strength that we didn't realize that we had. Um, cause then we get to sort of like in that grounding, we get to sort of move forward as our highest selves and not just sort of like the continued perpetual, like expanding of our own traumas that get passed down to like from one person to the next, to the next. You said something in an interview that really piqued my interest and made me think about it a lot in terms of myself. You talked about being a person who moves through anger very quickly and that you mm. moved to forgiveness. And obviously that's an incredible thing. And it made me wonder, I mean, anger is an absolutely appropriate um, emotion to feel, you know, Yeah. but if you can move through it quickly and move right to forgiveness, of course, that's a wonderful thing. And I wonder if you can elaborate on that. It's like, I'm like, oh. I want to be like that. Cheryl, you are really just, um, you're asking the interview questions of my dreams because this is all I ever want to talk about. <laughs> I'm really fun at parties. Um, uh, yeah, I think um, it's tricky with anger because I think there is a way, there's a healthy way of moving through anger towards forgiveness and there is an unhealthy way. And I think that I, that I had actually been, for whatever reason, avoiding f allowing myself to feel angry because I think I had associated the idea of being angry in some ways is, is being wrong, bad or wrong in some way. Um, and so I would try and skip over it. Um, which of course, anything that is avoided or rejected or repressed is just going to come back and get you some other way. Like that's just like a law of nature. And, and so, um, and so I don't, and I've spent a lot of time trying to unpack like why exactly I'm so uncomfortable with my own anger. I think I'm the kind of person that I really do want to put people at ease. I really do want to lead with kindness. Um, but I also think that there's like some of the unhealthier aspects of that can, um, result in people pleasing, which is like, um, being afraid to feel angry or to express anger when it is appropriate and necessary. Um, and so um, I've actually been trying to allow myself to feel more comfortable and like embrace anger as like a very valuable and necessary emotion um, and not just sort of like trying to move through it too quickly, but, um, but then to not like poison yourself with it, right? To not like let it sit with you for so long um, that, it's, that it's just become this toxic calcified rust on your heart. Um, and so, um, there's like a balance between the two of like, I think a certain amount of anger and a certain amount of actually feeling that feeling and allowing yourself to not be ashamed that you're feeling it is, is a, an important part of like, um, moving through it in a healthy way. 
I absolutely agree, and I want to uh, keep in touch with you and track how you're mm. doing on the progress with that because that's <laughs> yeah. a process that I work on as well. And I, I, again, like you, I feel like anger is a very um, useful and powerful tool. I mean, we feel it, and we don't want to press it away because something else is going to come out somewhere for sure. And absolutely. I also think as a woman, you know, I struggle with, you know, my right to be angry. Absolutely. Um, we have a lot of we have a lot of uh, really poisonous thoughts about uh, female anger, um, and I think we like belittle it, or we paint someone as a you know a word that I'm probably not supposed to say on the radio, or we, um, or we think it's cute, you know, oh you're so cute when you're mad, you know, and like it's like it's it's hard to to find the dig we don't like see the dignity in righteous anger. Uh, the righteous anger of uh, like a female bodied person. Um, and I do, yeah, I do think that's in many ways, like we're socialized to sort of like to, to uh, always pay attention to and accommodate others needs ahead of our own or, um, you know, so it's like, it's, it's a tricky one. And I do think it doesn't feel natural to me and I don't think that it ever will. Um, but you know, that was part of the, a song like Price of Blue, for example, that's a very angry song. Um, and there's a certain like triumph to it, but a lot of what that song is about is like, is trying to allow myself to sit with my own anger and like in my body and like really feel it and allow myself to sing and say things that were spiteful, really, that actually are not what I truly believe in my highest self, but that like felt like needed an outlet for them. And that's, that's a perfect outlet is putting it in a song because it doesn't have to live in your body anymore. Well, I love I love the whole album, but it's funny that I have called out that song twice now yeah. <laughs> about how much it reaches my soul yeah. and, and also how much, you know, jubilation it gives me to hear it. So clearly I'm glad. clearly I'm responding the way you meant to. Well, speaking of music, let's listen to some more right now. I'm talking to Jen Wozner of Flock of Dimes and the beautiful new record Head of Roses out April second on Sub Pop Records, I should Yay! mention. Let's Seattle, let's talk baby. about that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> let's talk about that when we get back. But let's hear some more music. Here's Lightning and Hard Way from Head of Roses by Flock of Dimes, live on KEXP at home. <laughs> So sky looks like alien and I'm green too. With too many days Not knowing you Trying to all keep it I watch this But I can't sing like that And if you dream Who is it that you see? Cause it isn't me When you dress me Be. 
But I can't understand tried to love he was just a song something I could not say couldn't call it off couldn't make it last so I took the hard way Something that you said I could not forget Set it in to motion Hiding as a glow Quiet and so slow Shattered my illusions If I only knew half as much as you, I would be amazing. Hazy. If I stop to be long enough to see. The life and death of one day Heavy in my heart Honey in my head When I took the heart your hand I know I could stay 
understand without your protection just because I know doesn't mean I'll go it would be the hard way Jen, you've talked in the past about um, pain that you've experienced and not being in the same place now. You know, you referred to the glacial pace of record releases and you were in what sounds like some pretty excruciating pain when you were processing this through the writing of the record. But you're past it now. I mean, you're not heartbroken anymore. And you've also talked about being reluctant to distill this record just being about heartbreak because it's just about so much more. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, when you start performing these songs again, you won't be in that place of heartbreak. So, And that is the interesting thing about making records uh, in general is that, you know, you, you sort of like draw this outline of yourself in space and time, and then you just keep taking steps forward into the future. And inevitably that outline gets further and further in the rear view, um, which I think is, um, it's a beautiful thing too, you know, to have these like signposts of where you were and, um, and what you learned along the way. Um, I, I treasure that. Um, and I'm sort of making peace. I think I've done a good job in my life uh, in the past few years of making peace with learning how to perform songs that I may not be necessarily like super comfortable with inhabiting that emotional space in that particular moment. It is a challenge for me um, because I think I am maybe a writer and a producer first and a performer second. And so I'd rather, it would be my preference to sort of like inhabit whatever is relevant to my, the present experience and not something that's old. Um, but there are ways of, I think, the, you know, also the more comfortable I get with myself in general and the less I shed some of this like residual shame that I've been carrying around, um, the easier it is to, to get into, to be like just kinder to my older self and not so hard on her. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think it's also, I think, you know, regarding what this, this record, you know, I, I think I spoke to this a little bit before, but this record kind of really unfolded in a really fascinating way to me. Um, because it is about, it was so much this one specific experience of heartbreak, but it just really kind of came to, I came to so many realizations about, um, my own trauma and my own healing, um, and what that process might look like in others. Um, and, my an awareness of of patterns um and so it is i think a lot of the pain that i was in was not directly linked to this one experience of loss of heartbreak it was um these layers of compounded loss and grief that i instead of feeling and processing as they were happening to me um when i was younger and going all the way back to my childhood um I chose, you know, I chose instead to cope by distracting, moving on, moving forward. Um, you know, there were so many, there are so many ways of distracting ourselves from, uh, that healthy processing and feeling of our feelings in the moment. Cause it's painful. Um, and also because no one teaches us this stuff. That's the other crazy thing. It's like, I feel like we should be talking about this more because how are we supposed to just figure this out? I mean, it's, it's wild to me, but, um, but yeah, so I think uh, it's it goes a lot deeper for me than just this one experience. I mean, I think it was absolutely the, that in combination with the pandemic was sort of the catalyst for it, for sure. Um, but the actual experience of it resonated much deeper into my past than, um, than I had really anticipated it would. Well, along those lines, you talked about finding the spark of love in other parts of your life besides romantic relationships and kind of how mind altering that realization was to you and how powerful it is that you can harness it in so many different ways in your life. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, I think that the, um, the trap that I think people can get into, or should I say people as if I'm talking about anyone but myself, um, <laughs> <laughs> good one. Uh, the trap that I have fallen into and that is very easy to fall into is, 
um, when you when you are just really taken with someone and really just feel this profound connection, it can be easy to feel as though they are this sole source of that sense of um, I don't know. It sounds corny, but like it's a thing that I've come to think of as like touching touching God, like making contact with something larger than ourselves. Um, and that's beautiful. And and I don't want to, um, that's, you know, that's something that I still feel like I seek out. I think in, in all of the things that mean the most to me, my, my relationships, my work, my friendships, um, that sense of, uh, being in communion with something sacred and holy and bigger than us is, um, it's just a really big part of it. Um, and so I think, uh, I'm, I'm such a sentimental romantic person at heart. And I think when you feel, when you, when you sense that potential in a person, when you really feel that connection, it can be so easy to forget that like, there are other sources, like the person is not necessarily the source. They're just one path to the source and the source can be found in so many places and it can be found in other people and it can be found in other things and it can be found in nature and it can be found in yourself. Um, you know, and that's, it's a hard thing to hold on to when you're in pain and when you, you know, and you feel this connection, but you can't access it for whatever reason. Um, but I think I try and remember that, um, that the potential uh, for connection is everywhere and, and that we are able to really touch God and touch that sense of the sacred in even the most mundane moments. And that there's nothing standing in the way of us finding that source. Um, you know, it's something that I have access to and at, at any moment, just by being present with myself. Something else that you said that resonated with me, and I'm thinking about it now when I listen to you, what you just said is being your own witness to things that happen in your life and not necessarily needing someone else to validate them. And I mean, that's an important thing to learn as well. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's, we also need others too, right? Like we need to learn how to be interdependent um, and to rely on each other and to love each other and to care for each other. I mean, that's essential, but I think that, um, you know, I think as someone who has a tendency to really prioritize the needs of others, um, without even realizing that I'm doing so at, um, at a detriment to my own needs, um, it's, it can really be, it's, it's been actually incredibly profound to, to have nothing to focus on and sit with but myself and to have to come to rely on my own experience without that external validation. You know, and I also think we as musicians or artists too, we're like especially set up for this trap, right? Cause we were like, we are primed. The, the like, the like external validation pump is primed for us. And it's just like, take this thing that is your like heart and soul and offer it up to the world. And then like, let all the little tidbits of praise come back to you. And it just like sets up this, this loop. Um, and I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing as long as you have a healthy perspective about it. And as long as you don't lean in it too heavily and like come to rely on it in place of a sort of sense of your own, um, worth and value and meaning. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we're all, it's like, we're especially set up for that trap and, um, you know, I can fall into it even, even with that intention, like even with the best of intentions and in a sense of awareness, I can still be uh, susceptible without even realizing it. Well, it sounds like the last year has been an incredible opportunity for growth for you and that you have enjoyed it in many ways, but I imagine you're ready to head out on the road. I mean, I'm trying not to get my hopes up because at this point the world just, it's just going to happen when it's going to happen. But I, I think that I'm looking forward to playing music and being in community with other people very much. Well, we mentioned Sub Pop. You've had such a long and wonderful relationship with Merge Records as Y Oak and with this new Flock of Dimes record and the EP that you released last year that you forgot about. That I, I reminded did. You. <laughs> 
<laughs> you teamed up with Seattle label Sub Pop, and of course, we love the Seattle connection there. Yeah. How did you initially connect with them? Where did um, that- uh, a friend of mine, my friend Becca, who you know I, we met, um, we've become friends, but she works for the label and um, is a fan, and reached out, and um, you know we we talked for a long time. And I wasn't really in a hurry to make another Flock of Dimes record because I had my hands full in a number of ways. Um, but I don't know. I mean, we just, it just sort of, I felt a real connection and a real genuine love and appreciation for what I was doing, uh, which is always really nice. You know, I mean, I think I, being, having worked for, you know, worked with Merge for so long, um, I'm, I'm very spoiled in that, like, I, I'm used to having these really good, um, kind of familial relationships with the people who I, you know, work with, which I don't think is the case for everyone. Um, and that's important to me. You know, I don't, I don't want to be, uh, on a team with someone that I feel like doesn't kind of respect and see my humanity and my artistry and, oh, you know, is not focusing on that and is only really seeing me as a way of making money. Um, so, um, I just really got that sense from everyone that I met at Sub Pop, you know, um, and I've had such a great experience working with them thus far. You know, it's, it's just really refreshing to be reminded that there are so many people in the poisonous, poisonous music industry that actually do genuinely really care so much about music and art and people. Um, and so, um, I feel really lucky. We have these two great label families now. Yeah, I know. Lucky. And I'm just very expanding. lucky as well. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm flattered. Thank you. Well, you recorded a Joan Armitrading song for us, The I Weakness did. in Me. What do you love about playing that song? Oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, when I found that song, I just made me feel a little bit less ashamed to, um, to be me because I think, um, you know, we're so hard on ourselves and sometimes it's uh, important to take a clear eyed stock of, um, choices that you've made and the the pains that you've caused others. But I think doing that with compassion is something that I've struggled with in the past, as opposed to like shame and and berating myself. Um, there are so many different ways to connect with another human being in the world. And there are so, um, You know, I really do think that it is, uh, it's possible to love more than one person at a time in different ways. Um, and that's a really confusing thing that there's just really not a lot of space for in at least like the more mainstream parts of our culture and how we're told that love is supposed to exist and what it's supposed to mean. Um, and so having experienced that firsthand with not a lot of guidance around what that means other than like, oh, I guess I just must be a bad person. Um, it's, it's such a gift to hear a song like this because it makes you just feel, um, more just human, you know, just like a human being who's like trying their best to figure it out and trying to, um, you know, we're all a bunch of sensitive weirdos. We just want to love and be loved. We just want to be seen and understood and it's hard and, you know, it sucks that there's no way to move through the world without um, hurting others and being hurt yourself. But like when you hear a song like this, I think it just makes me feel a little bit more at peace with who I am and, um, and what I've, where I've been and where I'm headed. Mm. Well, let's listen to it now. It's Jen Wasner of Flock of Dimes, and this is The Weakness in Me, live on KEXP at Home. This is a cover song by Joan Armour Trading. I'm not the kind of person who falls in and quickly out of love But to you I gave my affection Right from the start I have a lover who loves me How could I break such a heart 
But still you gain my attention Why do you come here When you know I've got troubles enough Why do you call me When you know I can't answer the phone Make me lie when I don't want to And make someone else some kind of unknown fool You make me stare when I should not Are you so strong is all the weakness in me Why do you come here When you know I've got troubles enough I need to see you And I need to hold you Tightly Feeling guilty and restless Waking from tormented sleep This hard love has me bound But the new love cuts deep If I choose now, I lose all One of them has to fall but I need you and you Why do you come here When you know I've got troubles enough Why do you call me When you know I can't answer the phone Make me lie when I don't want to and make someone else some kind of unknown fool You make me stare when I should not Are you so strong is all the weakness in me Why do you call me when you know I've got troubles enough But I need to see you and I need to hold you You're listening to live on KEXP at home. It, Jen Wasner is with us, A Flock of Dimes, and that beautiful song. I felt everything you were just talking about before you played it. Thank you so much for making these incredible videos for us. And I can't believe I almost forgot to mention to you, I actually had a little health issue at the end of 2019 and early 2020, and then the pandemic hit. So the last time I saw a live show was in September of 2019, and it was two Bon Iver shows, one in Vail and one at Red Rocks. Oh, gosh, I, you came to those shows. Wow. I did, and I had never been to Red Rocks, and so, I mean, Sharon Van Etten opened. Yeah, that's right. And, oh. But, I mean, so amazing. You can just do anything, <laughs> and watching you play... Those beautiful oh. songs, you know, oh, collaborating you. with those musicians on that beautiful stage and that beautiful setting. I can't wait to get out to see live shows again, like everyone, but oh, that's you my beautiful me memory of oh, my last show. <laughs> goodness. Well, hearing you say that just brought all those memories back for me too. And, and you and me both, I, I hope that we can get to see each other out there again for too long. I look forward to it. Me too. And I cannot wait to see what you do with the live set with these new Flock of Dime songs. Thank you so much for sharing them with us today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for asking me to do this. It was really, really fun to make those videos. But I hope that next time I can actually come into the studio with professionals who know how to record and <laughs> make music and make videos. Um, that, will be, that will be a joy. Well, we would love to have you stop by here. So please do come by when you're in town and meeting with your label. Yeah, I can't And playing wait. a live show for all of us, I hope. Uh, God, can't wait. 
Thanks to all of our wonderful listeners for joining us today. We appreciate your support so much here at KEXP, making these incredible sessions possible. And please do subscribe to our YouTube page, and you can find out about all this great music coming your way. It's Flock of Dimes live on KEXP at home. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Cheryl. Discover new music at listenerpoweredkexp.org.